yo, hey yo, hey yo, yo. Pack the chrome styles fly like Mrs. Jones. Lyrical mathematics will have the devil smoking stones. I put heads to bed, lick shots and records fed with the church a few times. Now you walk down the street, you see a dead cat. You just leave it. It's not your problem, right? Okay. All right. Database networking. So um, quickly before we, we we jump into this stuff. Uh, Administrator things. So I sent everyone on Monday uh, that, had, that has a, an approved database system for Project 2. I sent you a sign-up link. And I realized that looks kind of sketchy. Like, it's like this, here's this URL. I told you to click on it. Uh, but it's, all it is, is it basically is a encrypted key with your username and, and, or sorry, your email address. You sign up for an account. And then I should post something past that too. Once you're, once you're registered, if you go to the, your system, there'll be a link at the top that clicks edit. And then you'll see a, you'll see the form you can fill out, right? It's not it's not Wikipedia where it's free form text. There is actually again a taxonomy which you're allowed to select for certain things. And again, if, there's, if there's an option that doesn't exist that you want, please let me know and we can fix it. Um, and all right, so then for for Project Three, again the status update will be in two weeks on April third, uh, and then the final presentation is, is at this time here. I, I don't know what the room is yet. So, all right, so any questions about Project Two or Project Three at this point? If you want to discuss Project 3 or even Project 2 with me, please let me know. I know somebody already reached out to Google to talk, they have a call with them this Friday to talk about LODB. Impressive. Uh, but if other, other people want to, again, make introductions uh, to people, to companies, let me know. <laughs> already worked with LODB, so you, you already know everything. Yeah. Okay. All right. So here, here's where we're at in the semester, right? So this is a high level overview of, of the system we've been conceptually building. Um, but we've been sort of starting at the, the bottom, going to the top, and you know the, the topics we have covered. Time, we've we, you know the, the planner stuff we're talking about next week, the execution engine stuff we, we've discussed all this, and the storage layer we, we discussed this as well. Um, check boxes. There we go. Right. So today we're now going back to the top of the system, and we're going to talk about the networking layer, um, and we're mostly refocusing on the communication between the client. We'll talk a little bit about the, if you have like if it's a distributed system, you have one node talk to another node, or even have like the storage manager talk to uh, a, a remote storage service like the object store. We'll talk a little bit about that. But we're really focused on the client sending the queries to the database server. And then the next step starting next week will then come into this and say, okay, how do we take that SQL query and convert it into a logical plan, a physical plan, uh, and execute it, okay? All right. So as I said, today's discussion is focused on the networking layer, um, and we're going to start off talking about the, uh, you know, again, the, the way a database, uh, the client's going to interact with the, the database system. In a distributed system where, you, where the, the nodes need to communicate with each other, th there isn't actually that much literature about what goes on there. Uh, oftentimes, uh, Google protocol buffers are used, or gRPC. We'll talk a little bit about that. But there isn't, uh, how do you say this? In that world, because the, the, the database system itself controls what it's talking to, right? It's not to the client, to the, to the server. It's a server to server. They can be very optimized and rewrite things and swap things out and, as, as needed, right? Uh, whereas the client, we're sort of constrained with, with how you know, legacy applications or legacy libraries are going to interact with the database server. So we're mostly focused on that. Um, and then we'll talk about. Uh, you know, what this protocol looks like, and then we'll finish up with some optimization methods that go. The paper you guys read talks a, maybe a little bit about like RDMA stuff, um, but we'll, we'll go in more detail what, what this actually looks like. Okay, and this is sort of the cutting edge stuff. Like this is the stuff that's happening now in Linux, like in the last two or three years. I mean, RDMA has been around for a while, but other, other things. All right, so um, I don't think I've actually done any demos this semester uh, because it's it's hard to give for like you know. Compilation, it's hard to show demos of this uh, and other things. But in the intro class, when we give demos, we've always shown it like with the black screen and the terminal client, psql with the MySQL terminal, right? I, I type SQL queries in my hand, I hit enter, and I get back uh, some result printed in the terminal. And so in all of those examples, the results we're getting back is in plain text. Like it's literally like, like invoking two string on the packets that are coming back, and it, so that you can display it in the terminal. But in a real application, you, you couldn't write programs like that because it would be horribly inefficient to have to parse the text and figure out what the type it actually should be. So today, we're really talking about these uh, database system protocols or, or wire protocols where you're actually now transmitting data in binary form for some 
to go into an application to, to, to programmatically operate on, you know, and not a human actually looking at it through, through a, like a terminal interface. So there's basically three approaches to do this. Well, not there's three approaches. There's, there's, there's three sort of categories of libraries, APIs that people are going to use. The first is going to be sort of direct access that is database specific. Um, and this will be like a proprietary API that the, the vendor provides in like typically like a, like a C library. Uh, and you, you wouldn't, you could, but you shouldn't or wouldn't want to build your application using one of these direct access APIs because they're really meant for like people building you know, derivers for different languages. Like the, 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 the API is very specific to that different database system. Just to show you, so here's, here's the documentation for the Postgres uh, libp, libpq uh, library, the C API, and then here's the one for MySQL. Um, and you can see, kind of see a little bit here, like it's, everything's very Postgres specific. Like you couldn't take the, you couldn't write this for Postgres and immediately port it to, to make it work for MySQL if you're using the API. Um, if you ever want to know what these actually look like, you can actually <laughs> ask ChatGPT to write you a C program, uh, and it actually works, right? Uh, I didn't actually try to compile it, but uh, it looked correct. Right, but again, you can, you can see things, again, it's, it's invoking the libpgq uh, lib library for all these things. Right, so these exist. Every vendor is going to have their own thing, and, and again, it's typically for C. What I want to talk about instead, and spend more time on, is ODBC and JDBC, because this is, this is basically how most people are going to implement uh, uh, applications today. Now, if you're writing, like, in Python, uh, uh, or other programming languages, oftentimes they'll be, they'll have native, imp either, well, it'll, be, it'll look like like GDBC, where there'll be either native implementations that speak the wire protocol of the database system in that specific language, or they invoke down into the direct access API that's written in C. Okay? So, again, the idea of these libraries is that it's a, it's a standard programming interface so that I, if I write my program using, <coughs> using JDBC in, for MySQL, I could easily switch it to Postgres without having to change any of the API calls, the way that I couldn't do with, with direct access. But you don't need to rewrite the SQL. Right, as he points out, he had to rewrite the SQL because, as we said many times, the SQL dialect often is, gonna be, is not going to be the same. Right? And there's even another higher abstraction layer you could have above this. If you use like an ORM, Object Relational Mapper, if you use like Django, Ruby on Rails, SQLize for Node.js, right? these things abstract away the SQL and the database system entirely because you write through it like an object interface. But again, underneath the covers, they're, gonna, they're, they're eventually going to come down and call one of these guys because they have to, somebody has to talk to the database server. All right, so the first, uh, the first sort of standard API for talking to databases was this thing called ODBC. Um, and again, prior to this, everyone had their own proprietary programming libraries. Um, and so there was an attempt in the 1980s to try to build out a standard API because uh, people recognized this problem that like the the applications were, were very the database applications were not portable because because everyone's writing to the, the direct API. Um, but the, it, there was something out of Sybase was pushing, uh, uh, called, it was called, like, called like DB library, something real generic. That didn't go anywhere. Microsoft realized that this is a problem. Uh, and they formed a consortium with this other company called Cinema Technologies and started this ODBC connection, uh, or, the ODBC uh, library. And now pretty much today, every single relational, uh, major relational database system even the NoSQL guys, they're all going to have uh, some, some, some version of ODBC that, that, they'll, that they'll support. Right? Even like NoSQL systems like Mongo, who don't support SQL, but they'll support the ODBC API. Because instead of making SQL calls, you make whatever their, their JavaScript uh, query calls. So again, it basically looks like this. So ODBC is going to use a programming model called the device driver model, where the idea is that the, the the vendor provides the driver that's going to have all the logic to, to convert whatever commands that you make in the application and then speak to the database system. Right? Similar to like if you buy a piece of hardware and you get a device driver for your kernel that knows how to have, allow the kernel to talk to the hardware. So it's sort of the same thing. So the application is going to write code against this standard ODBC, ODBC API. And then the ODBC driver is going to then convert those, those, those commands that you write to the library into requests that go over the network to the database system, data system then runs the query, runs whatever you wanted to do, you get back a result, and then this thing marshals it back into the, the, the expected format, the, the correct format, right? So like things like if your, the ODBC API might specify things like 32-bit integers, but your database system stores everything as 64-bit integers, the, the ODBC driver is responsible for converting that back into 
uh, to conform to the to the API, right? Now the the, the standard AWC format is going to be all in C, C++ types, right? So it's not it's not that far fetched because most systems are going to be implemented in C, C++ less so. But back then in the 1990s was certainly the case, and most applications in the Windows world in the early 1990s were written in C and C++. Now things are much different, but back then it was it, that was the hot language. That was that, those are languages everyone used. So what's interesting about this approach is that the, the driver can implement or emulate some features that the, the, the API specifies on the driver side, the client side, but the server may not, not actually implement itself, like cursors. Um, so the, the idea of a cursor is to be like you, you, you send a request to open a cursor on the database system, and it sort of spools up the results, and you can sort of get next and get things in batches. If your system doesn't support that, then you just get back the entire query, and then the, the driver can, can, can hold all the results and, and then emulate uh, you know, the, the cursor API. So it's kind of interesting what, what, what you can do uh, with, with these things. So the part we care about this, this class is this piece right here, this back and forth. And I'm going to refer to this as, as the wire protocol or the network protocol of, of the database system. So again, ODBC was early 1990s from Microsoft. Uh, and then Sun Microsystems in the, in the 1990s when they came out with Java, um, they recognized that they needed a way for all these Java applications to interact with, with, with database systems. Uh, and so they proposed this thing called the JDBC, the Java, Connection, Java Database Connectivity Libraries. Uh, and this is the way to, it's, way, it's basically like ODBC, but instead of written in C or C++, it's for Java applications, right? And so back in the day when Java first came out in the mid 90s, like th th this was this was the rust of, of the '90s, right? <laughs> like this this was the hot thing. I'm being serious, right? I mean, usually there's every every five ten years there's another hot programming language, right? It was good. Sounds like a quality show. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Go was the hot thing maybe ten years ago because Google invented it. Rust is the hot thing now. In the in the 1990s, it was Java, right? When was C++ the hot thing? Uh, '90s, early '90s. Late, late, late 80s, early 90s. I see. Yeah. Um, Object-oriented programming languages were the hot thing in, in like late 80s, early 90s. And then there was object-oriented databases. That was a big thing where people said, oh, you don't want to write SQL. You want to write object-oriented programs that talk directly to the database system. Right? They're basically the same thing as document JSON XML databases now. Congo. Yeah. But have you ever heard of Versant? No. O2? No, right? These are, these are the hot database systems <laughs> that didn't go anywhere because the relational model crushed them, rightfully so. All right. All right, so again, back then, Java came out. Everyone's like, this is groundbreaking. Everyone wants to use this. The idea of like, you're going to write code once and it runs the JVM anywhere, uh, that was a big deal. Um, and so, but in the very beginning, they, you know, there wasn't going to be all these implementations of the, of the, of these, for these different database systems to connect to the database using GDBC. So they had to deal with a way to bridge into or use ODBC as a stopgap solution to get started. And then eventually people would start implementing uh, the, the native Java implementations. Right? So there's actually four ways to do this in, uh, in, in JDBC. The first one is, as, a, as, a, as I was saying, where you, you don't have a native Java implementation, but you have one in ODBC. So you have a... Uh, a little piece of code that can convert the JDBC calls into ODBC calls and let ODBC talk to the database system. Um, the next approach would be you would have, uh, and this would be like literally transforming the calls into the ODBC calls. The next one we'd have a, uh, using something like JNI, where you could have the, the JDBC call into, uh, well, sorry. This one is like using JNI to talk to the ODBC. This is using JNI to call the C library of the database system. Uh, this one would be you have a whole separate like middleware, like a separate process running that just knows how to take in JDBC requests and then uses like ODBC or whatever that the native API to then talk to the database system. That's sort of an extra hop to do that conversion. And the last one is, is the best case scenario where the, the protocol itself is written in entirely in, in Java. Right, and again, m most of the systems, like most of the major database systems, when you download their, the, you know, the jar file for, for their database system, for the driver, it's going to be a native implementation in, in Java of the wire protocol. Right? This is the fastest because it's going to be less copying between the, the different layers. So this top one was uh, deprecated and in, in, in removed in 2014. This is the best approach. 
again, not just for Java, but I say like, you know, if you're doing this in Python and in other languages, this would be the best approach as well, All right? So from the database system perspective, it doesn't know whether you're talking to it through ODBC or JDBC or whatever, or the direct API. They're just, they have a standard wire protocol and they're gonna, they're gonna operate on that. So all the major database systems are gonna have uh, their own proprietary client wire protocol that's, that's gonna go over TCP IP. Um, if, you're, if the database system is running on the same machine as the application, uh, some systems support like Unix domain sockets. I don't know what the equivalent is in Windows. I'm sure they have something, right? But like, and basically, instead of doing like a loopback device of going down through TCP IP on the OS coming back up, you can have like a direct IPC through a socket on the box and do fast communication. Um, and Postgres, Postgres will, will fix it, figure this out for you. I can run more, more quickly this way. I don't know of any database system that uses UDP, UDP uh, connections for client communications. Uh, there'll be, there's one system I know Yellow Brick uses UDP to, for the nodes to talk to each other, but for the, for the server, sort of the client talking to the server, everything's over, done over TCP IP. And the paper you guys read, they talk about how, like I think it was DB2 and Oracle send confirmation messages about when you get results back. Like, I got this, give me more. That's basically what TCP is doing underneath the covers, right? Because you're getting all the acts that you got stuff. So, so the, some of the data systems will have redundant, um, will have redundant messages over TCP IP. I'm sure there's some reason why, why that's the case. Maybe it's from the, again, from the 80s or 90s, I, I don't know. So the typical way people are gonna interact with the clients and the, the database server is that the client's gonna to wanna to talk to the data system, so it connects to it, begins the authentication process. Sometimes they're running an SSL or TLS. Uh, I think I, I should have posted, like there's a, someone did a survey where they, of Postgres databases in the wild where like only 20% of them are using SSL or TLS. Uh, which is surprising, because it's owned by default. I, I would think it'd be higher. Um, all right, so we get through the authentication process. Then we send a query. Uh, the database system is going to execute the query, and then needs to serialize the results back, and then or serialize the results into you know, the, the return set, and then send that back to the, the client over the wire protocol. So the part that we care about in this lecture today is this piece here. Right, this, is, this is the part that uh, is going to eat most of the time up, and is, can, can there's different design decisions that are gonna affect the performance of the system uh, when we do this. All right, and all the, major, all the major database systems are gonna have their own wire protocols that are not gonna be compatible. Um, and so this again, this is what ODBC, JDBC is trying to solve, that the API is the same even though the wire protocol for each system is, is gonna be different. And then the driver takes care of all of the, the marshalling as, as needed, all right? I would say also too, sending the SQL request usually is not the most expensive part. The most expensive part, especially in the world we're talking about today is OLAP queries, is obviously executing the query, but we've, we've covered how to speed that up. And that's why we're focusing on this today. Most queries are a couple kilobytes. Uh, the most I've ever heard of like really large SQL queries uh, was actually, it was Google and another place. They said they had 10 megabyte SQL queries. Like the string of the SQL statement itself was 10 megabytes. Right? And, that was, and it's obviously not written by a human, it's someone clicking on a bunch of dashboards, different options to, to and then the, the program generates the query and they run it. But that's, and then it's, it's usually like these massive in clauses. Uh, but again, like that's, there's, there's not much you can do to optimize that, sending that over, other than, other than just compressing it, because it's just a string. So as I said, all the major vendors are gonna have their own uh, proprietary protocol that, that does all this step here. The one thing that is, that is new in the last 10 years or so in database systems is that a lot of these new systems are, not, are choosing not to implement their own wire protocol and are just using an existing one, right? So the, the MySQL protocol is probably the most common, then, then Postgres. Um, I'll see if you wanna guess what the last one is. Uh, but the idea here is like rather than spending your engineering effort, which again, if you're, early, if you're like an early stage startup or you're a research project like we were, Instead of having to implement your own wire protocol, then go implement your own client drivers for whatever programming language that's out there. If you just implement the Postgres protocol, then you get the Postgres uh, ecosystem for free, at least for, for client libraries, right? Um, you know, you get the, all the drivers for free for any programming language, a bunch of these tools that are out there will connect to Postgres and do stuff. Like you get all that for free if you implement the wire protocol. I mean, you have to implement some other stuff too, like the catalogs, 
obviously the SQL dialect and like any other additional functionality, but you can make it make your system smell like Postgres. And the first step is usually you know speaking the wire protocol. Um, all right, so I said MySQL is probably the most common one. Uh, wire protocol that implements Postgres is probably the second most common. And I'm going to take a guess what the third one is. If it's not in the paper you guys read. No guesses. SQLite? SQLite doesn't have a wire protocol. It's in, it's in process. Uh, never mind. Yeah. Redis. Uh, uh, th there's, more, there's more logos here I forgot to put there, right? Oh. Um, Right, so here's, so this is from DBDIO. You, there's, a, there's an option you click on compatibility and I keep track of like what systems are compatible with, with the, uh, you know, with the, with the Postgres, MySQL and other things. I probably should split up whether they're SQL compatible, like the dialect or the, the wire protocol. We can do that later. But there's a bunch from MySQL. A, but a lot of these are gonna be, there are like forks of these systems. Mm -hmm. Like Greenplum is a fork of Postgres. Uh, Vertica was a fork of Postgres. Redshift is a fork of Postgres. So these systems get the wire protocol for free because the, the forks of it. Um, Systems like Materialize, Umbra, Cockroach, Hyper, we did this in our own system, uh, in, in Noise Page and Peloton. Like we re, re, you look at the spec and you re-implement the, the Postgres wire protocol from, from scratch. Um, the Redis one is curious, I'm curious about this because it's like a, I think it's like a REST API, it's, it's pretty simple. And it's like plain text API with like simple like commands, like get, set, and things like that. And these are all like, for, except for Apache Geode, which came out of, um, I think VMware, uh, these are all Chinese. I can't find, like, oh, TDB's in Canada. But these are all, like, Chinese Redis clones, which I find is very, I don't know why. Um, anyway, so the, as I'm saying, like, this, if you're going to build a new system today, this is the right approach. And the Postgres wire protocol kind of sucks. It's very chatty. Uh, you have to do two modes, the text mode for the terminal and the binary mode for, for, for GDBC, ODBC. Uh, and it's, it's pretty inefficient, as you saw, we, as we read in the paper. But because you don't have to implement the drivers, this, I think starting with this is, is the right approach. All right? And again, you see some systems will they'll lop off the top half of Postgres. Like Yugabyte took the top half of Postgres, ripped out, threw away the bottom half, and that, that way they get the wire protocol uh, for free through that. All right, so today we're going to talk about, again, the, the focus of this paper. What I love about this paper is it's like the only paper that, well, I thought of this problem before, like, you know, earlier when we were building our own system, but they're the only ones that wrote it. There hasn't really been any really deep follow-ups on this like, survey. Like, here's all this wire protocol, uh, these different systems that are doing things differently. Let's understand what's going on. And that's actually a paper I like to write where you see some functionality, some piece of a database system where everybody's doing something completely different. Uh, and you, there's not really a good justification of why they're making certain design decisions. And for someone to come and do a survey, here's all the all different approaches, here's the pros and cons of each of them. Uh, to me, that, that's, a, that's a good contribution to the scientific community, and that's why I really like this paper. We have a similar one that we wrote uh, that actually came out of 721, where we looked at how different systems were implementing MVCC. Everybody's doing something different. We just sort of measured them all, all of them in a single system and understand what's going on, um, and we, we published a paper on it. So, all right, so this paper came out of the, the CDO, you guys, uh, in, in the Netherlands. Um, so this was before DuckDB. They were working on a project called MoneyDB Lite. Um, and that's what the, these guys were working on at the time they wrote this paper. And then they went through that code away and then, and then became DuckDB. So the guys who wrote this paper are the DuckDB authors, uh, Hannes and, and the other dude. So the paper is, is focused on doing large data exports, which is not quite you know, typical to sort of the applications we think about in database systems, right? We think about, like, you run a query. Uh, even, even if it's OTP, you get a small, small number of results. If it's OLAP, it's a large, maybe you scan a lot of data, but it just gets aggregated and the results small. In their world, they were thinking about how, uh, how people were actually using database systems for data science applications, like pandas uh, and, and, and other things, and where you basically want to do a bulk export of the entire table get it into your, your Python application, and then let, let pandas or whatever do the computation on it. So that's the problem they were focused on, trying to figure out, okay, what is the overhead of doing bulk export of, of these different systems what, when, if you go over the wire protocol? Right, some of the uh, cloud vendors will let you do exports of data into like a CSV that gets written in object storage. If you already have Parquet files as well, then you download those. This is really, if you have data residing in a database system, how do you get it out that quickly? So 
I would say also too, when we talk about these optimizations, anything that we're going to come up with, like they're going to list a bunch of things that you could do, could do to make things better. But anything we say, this is the right way to do it, this is the better way to do it, we also have to implement this in the client driver. Because the client driver basically has undo, undo whatever we, the, the server sends it. So even if we come up with a great compression scheme, uh, if it's very expensive to decompress, the, the driver's got to do that. Um, and you know, so, so that's, well, we're also existing with existing drivers, so it's like we can't just say, here's this magic new feature we have in our database system, and everyone gets it, because if the driver doesn't support it, then, then no, one, no one can use it. Because typically when you connect to the database server, there's a handshake where you say, OK, I'm, I'm looking for this version. I have these features. I can handle these things. Uh, like Sort of like you know, when, you, when you SSH into something, there's a handshake to say, here's the encryption modes I can support. So the database server can say, here's the, here's the features I can support. And then the, uh, the driver can decide whether, you know, what it actually wants. All right, so we'll go through these one by one. But the row versus the column is sort of obvious. Compression, data serialization, and string handling. I'll say also, dude, what, is this all, what does this sound like? We're talking about networking, but this sounds like what? Storage on disk. It's basically the same problem, right? The disk, the, 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 you know, it's just another store, hardware storage device, hardware device that it's slow to get data on and off. Uh, and we have this trade-off of deciding how much CPU overhead we want to spend on doing some kind of optimization versus the time it takes actually just to do the data transfer. Right? It's the same thing we saw in, when we talked about you know, reading ready data from disk. All right, so the first question is how are we going to execute, uh, how are we going to, the client is going to, is going to retrieve and process the data that it retrieves or it receives from the database server. So in ODBC and JDBC, these are inherently row oriented APIs because they were developed or invented in the 1990s when column stores were a thing, I'm sorry, they were, they existed conceptually, but there weren't, they weren't actually real systems other than Sybase IQ, which came out late, later in the 90s, like there wasn't column store database systems. Everybody was writing these, these applications that were going to process things row by row and, like in the database system. And so your application, of course, would process things row by row. Right? Think of like most of these applications at the time were, were sort of business oriented or OTP applications, where again, it was, it was not doing the hardcore analytics that, or machine learning stuff that we do today. Right? So and even if it, even if it was an, an analytical query, Again, you're doing aggregation. You're getting back a small number of results. So having an interface like this, like this, is, this example is, is JDBC, right, where I, I run a query, get a result set, and I iterate it row by row, and I can access all the columns within it and do something. Like this is how does everyone wrote code. But in, in, in modern analytics software, when we want to get the data out, put it into pandas or data frames or whatever, uh, we may not, you know, going row by row is going to be inefficient. And so they talk about how, you could switch to a pure columnar uh, API. Again, this is not real JVC code. This is like pseudocode, where you can iterate every single column, and then with each column, get, do something in each row, or get, get the bulk of the data and put it in somewhere. Uh, but this would be inefficient as well, because with this API, you won't be able to do anything on any of the rows, any other columns, until you process each column one by one. And so the solution is the same thing we saw when we talk about the storage models. It's basically packs, where instead of having a pure column or pure row format, let's do a hybrid approach. They call it a vector-oriented approach, where you get batches of, of tuples that may be laid out in columnar format, so you can export that data, put it into a matrix as, as a single column, as a stride or whatever. Um, but you don't get all the column. You get some, some portion of it. Right? So, what will come up, what I'll talk about in a second, this is what Apache Arrow does in, in their proprietary format, the ADBC, right? That it's, that's meant for transferring arrow, arrow data, which is a PAX layout. This is what they do now. So JDBC doesn't do this, but you can use Arrow's a, uh, API to do network transfer like this. But of course, when this paper was written in 2017, it, 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 uh, the Arrow stuff wasn't out yet. The next, the next thing we, we yeah, the next design decision is whether to do compression. And as the paper lays out, there's basically two approaches, just like it was when, when it was storage on disk, right? So the first one is to do what I'll call again naive compression, where it's just some general purpose uh, compression algorithm or compression library, gzip, uh, snappy, z standard, whatever, uh, and 
before we package up the messages or the, the, the message of the results to put on the, on the wire, uh, we just we compress the payload. And then we wrap some header around it that's specific to the, the database system. So there's very, very few systems that actually support this. Um, I forget whether in the paper they call out Oracle. I know they, I know they measure MySQL. Oracle has, has had this since 2013. It's called the Advanced Network Compression. Um, and then MySQL does this. It's optional. You, you have to turn it on if you want it. But you, you, can, get, you can get gzip compression for, for results. There's a patch from Postgres that somebody submitted, a Russian submitted in, in, in 2018 for a libpg, libpq. Uh, but as far as I can tell, that, like, that patch is dead. It didn't go anywhere. Um, you can hack around this. Uh, like you can have your database system uh, tunnel traffic through, through SSH, an, an SSH tunnel, and then compress that traffic if you want. Um, but that seems kind of flaky. I, I, I don't think anybody does that. Right? Uh, I, I don't see why you'd want to do that, because it, now it's an extra hop. The alternative to do denied compression is just as before. Like there's the, 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 the sort of the very specific or columnar specific encoding. So this is dictionary encoding, RLE, bit packing, delta encoding, all those techniques we talked about before, um, where the data system figures out, as looking at the results, that here's the correct, here's the, the best compression scheme for each individual column. And of course, nobody does this because, again, you'd have to not only implement this in, this, in the server side to do comp compress the data as it comes out, you'd also have to implement it on the driver side to be able to decompress it. And th that would be inefficient. And you would assume that, the, that you know, you're assuming that the client's going to have enough horsepower for this. Um, I don't talk about this. I don't really talk about it in this lecture, but a, a very common setup now is with these serverless functions, with these Lambda functions for interacting with database servers. So that's what's that? That's like spinning up a little Python function that immediately connects to the database server, gets some result, and then gets some process, does some processing, and then then goes away. And so in that environment, you don't want to be, you don't have a real beefy uh, client side, or you know, the client's not very beefy, so you don't, you don't want to be spending a lot of um, you know, a lot of cycles have to do heavyweight decompression. So the paper says that, again, the naive approach is going to be best uh, over this one because from engineering perspective and also the cost of, of figuring out how to, how to decompress things in, uh, on the client side, this one is pretty straightforward to implement, so this is, this is a better approach. Um, and it's more useful when the, the network gets slower. Right? So as, as the, there's this trade-off between the, the, the computational cost of doing the decompression or the compression and the, and the network transfer. So as the network gets slower, you're willing to pay more CPU overhead to reduce that transfer time. But as I said, only two systems that I know that do this. Uh, SQL Server doesn't do this. Teradata doesn't do this. I, I, don't, I couldn't find anything with DB2. And, it's, and all, both of these systems turn them off, turn them off by default. All right, so now the question is, how do we actually uh, encode our data? So, in the paper, what I liked about, I'm not going to go through it, but like, they went through every single database system. They said, here's what a packet looks like. And they talked about how to, do, to handle the strings, how they encode uh, the length of strings, how they encode uh, null values and integers and so forth. So I, I just want to go a little bit about at high level what these design decisions are. Um, but I, I, again, I like the paper that goes, I enjoyed it going into that much detail about the different systems. So the first approach is to do binary encoding. And this is where the, the database system is going to encode the, the, the data that it's sending back for the results of the, of the tuple into a, to like a binary format, like something like related to the, the IEEE 754 standard, like a C or C++ native type. You, you, you're, sent, you're encoding the data like that, and you send it, send it over. Um, so the client's going to have to handle Indianness. Like if the, if the, if the server is little Indian and it's, and it's packing the, the bits for, for integer, in little Indian format, but then the client is in big Indian, it has, the client is responsible for doing that conversion. Uh, most systems, most people are running on x86 or ARM, and those are little Indian, so like, this is not really an issue, but it is something you'd have to check in the client driver. And so I would say also too, the, the, in this approach, the closer the, the wire protocol's binary format is to the native storage format of the database system, then it's less work to put data into packets. Right? So we'll see this in a second. If you're doing like for strings, depending on how you encode your strings, are they null terminated or do you have the length followed by the bytes? <coughs> if, the, if the client expects it to be in a certain way, uh, sorry, if, if, if the, the network protocol expects the data to be a certain way and that's different than what the, the server actually natively stores this data as, then you have to do a copy to, and convert it. And there's additional overhead here. 
So we had this problem when we were building Peloton. We would store things. I think we were storing strings with the, the, the length followed by the, the bytes. But then the wire protocol, I think, wanted null terminated strings. You had to, so you had to do a copy and convert it, which, which is not cheap. Or it's, it's, it becomes expensive. So the an alternative approach is, well, the other thing you have to keep track of is like, how do you keep track of like what the metadata is of like, or specifying what the format is of, of the, uh, the, the schema of the data you're sending back. So if you roll your own protocol, you, you're responsible, like you, the data server, is responsible for encoding. So like, I have this, this many columns and, this, and they're this type and this size. All that has to go in the header. You have to keep, make sure everything is, is, is correct. An alternative approach is to use one of these uh, existing libraries like Google Protocol Buffers, uh, Facebook Thrift, and then I think Flat Buffers is the, 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 the newer version of Protocol Buffers. It just does like zero copy. So the, in these APIs, there's like there's a DSL. You define what the schema of the of the, the message you're sending look like, and then they compile a uh, a they'll they'll, they'll 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 do the transpile, convert that schema into actually code to be able to handle it. Now you wouldn't do this for a for for every single message you're sending back with different types, but it's one way to sort of ex to, to specify what the API actually would be or the, for the, your messages. So again, we can use ChatGPT to, to make these things. <laughs> so you can ask it, make me a, a protocol buffer specification for a table that has a name and a column, uh, name and a timestamp field, and then here's one for thrift, right? What's interesting is I didn't specify what language I wanted uh, for either of these, and this one gave me in Java, and this one, this one was, was in Swift, right? But just, again, this is the spec. You then transpile it using the, their compiler, and it, and it spits out the the, I think it'll spit out Java code, Python code, whatever you want. This speaks to the API. But again, this is just the wrapper around the message. You would still need the internal encoding of the data you're sending, which could be different from one query to the next. The other thing they do also too is like if you're doing like this could help keep track of like protocol versions. If you update new versions of the protocol, like this thing will keep track of all these things for you. Thrift does a bunch of other stuff too. They have like thread pools or RPC handlers. Uh, and, we looked at it for a while bidding our own system. We decided not to do it because um, it, it brought too much machinery we didn't want. And I'm also asked sometimes, uh, okay, with, like, with protocol buffers and these things, why would I even want to define my own data, like, data format uh, for the storage and plus the network protocol? Can it, can't they just be the same thing? And as far as I know, nobody does that uh, until I found this year there's a database called ProfaneDB that natively stores uh, protocol buffers and uses Google gRPC or Google RPC to send those protocol buffers directly out, All right? So somebody emailed. So there it is. So the other alternative is to do text encoding. And the idea here is that the database system can store all your, the data natively in, in a binary format, but when it goes over the wire protocol, we're always going to convert it into strings, like using the A2I, you know, the, 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 the C function. And then the, the, client cert, the client driver is responsible for doing the reverse of that, of converting the, bi the, the text strings back into whatever the binary data that the ODBC or JDBC needs, right? So this seems crazy, right? This seems like this would be super inefficient. And it is from, from a storage and, 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 and computational standpoint. But it does make a thing a lot, you know, you don't have to worry about any of it. It makes a bunch of stuff a lot easier, right? So just give you an idea of what the storage overhead is. Say I want to send the you know the 32-bit the integer one two three four five six, I can store that in four bytes in native format in the IEEE the IEEE 754 standard, like the, like the native C or C++ type it will be 32 bits so four bytes, but if I convert this to a string and send that over the wire, then I need six bytes for the uh, you know for the each individual character assuming I'm doing ASCII encoding, and then I need additional metadata to say what the size of the string is, right or or doing if I, or if I'm doing null termination. Right? So Postgres will do this. Postgres, with, with the, the text version of the protocol, they do this text conversion. And the paper that also talks about MoDB, MoDB does this uh, by default. Uh, now I forget in the MoDB case why they did it. They said it's like for some historical reasons. Uh, but I think if you're, if you're building a new system today, you'd want to do this, not, not, not this. Right? Because it's just it's more efficient. Uh, and, and you're going to get better performance. There's just less copying. 
All right, for representing strings, again, this is the same thing we talked about, or this, in, like when we talk about you know, storing varchars uh, on disk. So the first approach is just do null termination, like, like, like in C, like in libc or standard C library, where there's a, the last character is going to be this null, null, uh, null character. And so when the, the client is trying to, was, was scanning the packet, trying to find the, the or you know, get out the full result of, of, a, of a given attribute that's a string character, or sorry, string type, once you see this, this null terminator, you, you, you know you have it and you're done. All right, so we, again, assuming ASCII encoding, we need an extra byte to store this at the end. The way most systems are going to do this is through length, length prefixes, where, again, we just have something in the front of the var chart that says here's the length of, of, the, of the string. And then the last approach is to do fixed width uh, encoding, which I think, I forget what one of the systems, I think either ModiB or MySQL did this, where no matter what the size of the actual value of the attribute is, you always make the, 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 the payload of the value be whatever the max size of the attribute is. So think of like the difference between like varchar and char. So with like varchar 32, if I store one character in the database system, it'll store that one character followed by the length. If it's a char 32, then no matter what string I put in there, it's always going to allocate 32 characters. Same thing for, for this approach here. So the, the paper talks about how this, this is going to be obviously the best and the fastest if your strings are small because now you're, now you're not wasting space for uh, you know, storing the size for every single value or you know, in, in, in every single row. But of course, and then if it's a, you know, if it's a, if it's a char you know, 1024 and I'm only storing you know, one character strings, then I'm, I'm allocating much of space that's wasted. A naive compression scheme like gzip or snappy will go to town on that, compress that down because it sees long strides of, of repeated values. Um, but again, most data systems aren't using, using one of those compression schemes. So this will be the fastest if your strings are small. Uh, but in general, two is going to be faster. Um, oh, so, so, sorry, one is faster because you don't, you, there's less indirection for like looking for the, or like looking the, for the value. But again, you have to do this conversion into, uh, if, if you, your data system is storing this, and the wire protocol wants that, you have to copy it. All right, so I would say also, too, the, the, the performance of these different schemes are not independent of each other. Um, so you know, if, if we're doing padding with a, uh, have a lot of spaces, then if we, if we turn on compression, that'll work out great. Uh, if we're not doing compression, then, then one of these other ones is actually going to be better. It depends on what the data is as well, what, what the queries are trying to return back. So I'm going to show two graphs. Uh, they, the, you know, they talked about how there's this vectorized approach that they could have, uh, and they have some results on that. I'm, I'm going to ignore that for now because I want to talk about what actually exists in the real world today. Um, and then the, I'll talk a little bit about the ADB City stuff from, um, from the Apache Arrow. That's still very, very new. I think it came out last year. So I, I don't know. How, there's not many systems actually support that just yet. So there is there isn't a there hasn't been a scientific study to show like the vectorized approach when like, with Apache Arrow versus the existing ones, at least, at least that I'm aware of. All right, so for this first experiment we're going to transfer one tuple from a TPCH table, uh, and we just want to measure how long how long that, that takes, and they're going to compare against uh, MySQL with and without the uh, compression scheme, and then a bunch of these other database systems here. So it's I think the paper talks about being DBMSX, that's usually Oracle. Right, we can take that offline. All right, so here's the chart here. So the first thing to point out is that all of these schemes, except for MoniaDB, are are doing binary encoding, right? So only MoniaDB is doing text encoding, but yet it's still outperforming all these these other protocols. The paper talks about for MongoDB uh, because it's returning JSON that or uh, uh, the returning documents that they have to embed all of the, the scheme information for every single, uh, for every single record in, in, in the storage. Now, if we're getting back one row, it's not big of a deal because you have to store the metadata for all these other ones anyway. Um, but that'll be a problem when they start scanning a lot of data. For Hive, I think the reason why they're the slowest is that because it's going over thrift, the, the, the amount of data, the, the amount of additional metadata they're storing for just sending back that one tuple is super high. Um, and then for DB2, the reason why they think it's slower is a pure conjecture they don't know, uh, but they suspect that it's because it's doing acknowledgments 
at the application level in the, in the network protocol. So the TCP is doing acknowledgments. The data system is also doing acknowledgments with, with the client. So in the next graph here, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the cost to transfer 1 million tuples out of the table, uh, which I think is, is roughly about one, 1 gigabyte. Um, and along the x-axis, they're going, to, they're going to increase the latency of the, of the, 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 the network communication, or, you know, sending one packet. So they're going to go from uh, 0 0.1 milliseconds up to 100 milliseconds. 100 milliseconds is a long time, but that's it's actually not that bad, right? If you're going across data centers that, like, to, from, from di different geographic regions, you can easily get above this. But even with, even with one data center, within a data center, that's a bit high. But like, that certainly would be the cost of going to something like EBS or uh, S3. EBS is less than that, but S3 can be, can be longer. She made a face. <laughs> um, all right, so the first graph I want to show is MySQL with and without uh, compression. And what you see is that the regular MySQL protocol is, does much better, uh, almost an order of magnitude better than the compressed version up until the network gets slower. And then there's a crossing point, because that, now the network gets slower, uh, there's a trade-off where I'm willing to pay the CPU cycles to do compression, uh, and that's going to offset the, the, the slower network. It's not a huge difference, but you, know, you can imagine if this thing extended out to like 1,000 milliseconds, right, the, the lines would converge. Or sorry, the lines would, would split further. Right, so this is basically saying that compression overhead is bad when, when the network is fast. Most applications, again, if you're running in the same data center as, as, the, as the data system, the network will be fast. Um, if you're going across data centers, then, then you, you may want to consider using compression. And then for all the other ones, they basically end up converging and looking the same. Uh, the, the one to point out, though, is, is how much worse uh, uh, the, or the Oracle one gets. Right? So Oracle is when the network is fast, it's, very, it's, it's doing quite well. But then as it gets slower, then it's up here with Hive and, and DB2. And again, the paper is, is conjecture. They claim that it's because of the, the because of this additional acknowledgement that they're doing, uh, these confirmation messages from the client to the server, then, then that, that's why it, you know, the, the effect of that extra confirmation step makes things much slower on a slower network. Because the, the, that confirmation is not a big deal when you're over here, but when the network is slower, it, it becomes, becomes a bottleneck. So any questions about this? OK. So again, in my opinion, if you're going to build a new system today, I would start with the Postgres wire protocol, because you get all the libraries for free. Um, and then if, if your data system gets traction, then you should, you should, you should rewrite it and switch over. Yeah, sorry. Um, so, uh, like, why does MySQL plus Jesus save cost for this network transmission? Because the because the cost is is not the 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 network transfer. The call the main call the main bottleneck is the is the compression. The Jesus is a slow compression algorithm, right? So, I mean, you, it it's it gets slightly slower here as it ticks up, but but the amount of data I forget the exact number. It's compressing like almost like two or three x. Over the you know the, the the binary data of everyone else. So like, why doesn't it rise towards the end? Like it it does a little bit, but it's also log scale, so you don't see it. All right, so I want to show one slide about Apache Arrow. Uh, I'm not going to go too details of what it actually is, but the in the same way that we talked about before with like the Parquet and Orc being these open source file formats that. A bunch of different data systems now can support to allow you to easily uh, you know, reuse data generated from one system to another without having to convert it to their proprietary format. The arrow movement is basically the same thing, but for network transfers. Right? Now, there's a standard columnar uh, format for in memory data that if your system can support this, you can either you can ingest it or share it with other, other systems. So again, going back to this, you know, the, the whole motivation of the paper we read. They were talking about taking data out of a database system and then importing it into like pandas. And so the, the wire protocol for these different database systems would convert it to whatever format that they wanted. And then the py Python code had to convert it to the format that pandas wanted. So with Apache Arrow, the idea is that your database system could send memory buffers of, of Arrow formatted data down to the client. 
It doesn't have to do any unmarshalling, any de doesn't have to do any deserialization or any transformations. It just takes those, those, those blocks of you know, data and then gives that to pandas or whatever you want, and that and then pandas knows how to operate directly on that data. The idea is like it's, it's doing zero copy from the client server into whatever the application wants. So this was, uh, this project I, th I think was, was started by a bunch of other uh, database companies or sort of uh, people building open source projects. The original implementation came, and Java came from the Apache Drill people. Apache Drill is the open source re-implementation of Google Dremel, which we'll cover uh, uh, in, in a few weeks. But it was also sort of founded by Wes McKinney, the guy who invented Python Pandas, um, and a friend of the CMU database group. So, Again, the idea is, again, we, we have it. If you put your data in this arrow format, you can hand it off to something else without having to do any transformation. So the, there's a bunch of other sub-projects within Apache Arrow that are all sort of built around this, 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 this format. Uh, so on the wire protocols, the, the new one that came out last year is ADBC, right? the Arrow Database Connectivity Library. And this, again, this is a way for, if your database system supports this API, uh, and you have a client driver for it, you can communicate it with, as if it was like ODBC and get back PACS oriented or you know, columnar data in the Arrow format and then do whatever you want with it. There was a, a precursor to this called Arrow Flight or Arrow Flight SQL. And my understanding of this was just, it was a veneer in front of uh, something like ADBC where it would convert, uh, you would send it SQL commands and then you would get back Arrow formatted data. Whereas this is like specific to doing like gets and puts for uh, for error formatted data. There's a whole another project called Data Fusion where they're actually building an entire execution engine around the error format. Um, in, in the noise pace system we were building at CMU, that was natively stored things as Apache Arrow. So there's a bunch of systems that are, like, they're using this now on the inside. I know Snowflake can, can import and export data in the error format. Um, actually, I don't know about import. I know they can export for query results. Uh, some systems use Arrow for, for, the, for communicating internally. So, I can rattle up a bunch of buzzwords about what Arrow is, and you guys should all know what they are because we've covered this in the semester. Right? It's a PACS oriented format. You know what that is. It's doing, uh, and it's doing dictionary compression. We, we know what that is. There's not, there's not much anything else to it. And the way they're doing dictionary encoding is by, through pointers or offsets into an array of, of sort of values. Right? So that, again, I think that this is a good example where the things we talked about in, in this course uh, are sort of the bedrock for understanding how to reason about new technologies that come along. So now when you see something like this, ABC, you know what it's doing, you know what Arrow is doing, because you understand the trade of this, and now you can fit it into whatever the model or the, or the, or the system architecture you're thinking about building or working on. Okay. So the paper, again, focused on this idea of like, hey, these wire protocols are inefficient for this particular application domain that, that we want to deal with, right? Uh, and in the uh, in, 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 in the paper, they also talk about it's like you know, what happens when the database server is running on the, on the same system or sa same box. Uh, you still have to go through this wire protocol, e even if it's going over the, the main sockets. Um, and so the protocol itself, all, it's in inefficient, but it's not the only thing that's going to cause problems for us. And the answer, the, the one of the big challenges we're going to face is the OS. Right? You heard me say many times. The OS is our frenemy. The data system needs it to survive, but it's always going to get in the way of things and screw us up, right? Uh, and so we want to try to avoid it as much as possible. So we see this in storage. We, we want to use direct I/O. We don't want to use MMAP. And the same thing for for networking. We need we need something to talk to to the hardware uh, to get data in and out out of it for our network protocol. But the the TCP/IP stack in Linux is going to be slow. Right, because there's going to be context switches of, 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 of switching to kernel threads to do stuff. Then it's got to store stuff in buffers, and that's going to be extra copying, right? And the kernel is going to take its own latches of the inside to protect its data structures. And so now, if we're trying to get, you know, trying to get a lot of data through through that hardware, it's going to be slow. So I want to talk about two approaches, sort of two categories of approaches to work with and avoid the, the operating system for doing fast net network transfers. So the first one is going to be kernel bypass methods. Uh, do, do they teach this in other classes? I don't know. Oh. No, I yeah. don't think so. Okay, all right. So. I, mean, I learned about remote direct memory access in 7.12. Like, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So 
kernel bypass methods, the idea here is that the, the database system wants to avoid the OS as much as possible and do as much of the work that it needs to communicate with the hardware, in particular with, with the networking hardware, uh, directly itself. And the idea here is that we want to avoid, again, talking, have the OS maintain state, maintain its own you know, data structures, maintain its own buffers, uh, and we can just do everything ourselves. So the, you know, the reason why we, we, we have this problem is because Linux is a time-sharing system. It's a time-sharing OS. It has to rely on slow and expensive interrupts to notify the kernel when stuff happens, to wake things up, or when new packets show up and some, someone needs to do it. Right? The, the, the threading model in, in Linux is, is expensive. Right? There's all these data structures that maintains those latches on the inside for scheduling and, and context switches and so forth. Right? And these, it, you know, things just get worse with larger core accounts. Now, this has gotten better in recent years. Linux, Linux has gotten a lot better. But even then, the data system is in a better position to figure out how to, how to use resources. Right? So the idea of the kernel bypass is that these, these specialized APIs that allow us to avoid the OS as much as possible. Now, IUU ring is exploiting the OS. And we'll see why we need this in a second. Uh, but these, these other ones are more aggressive at this. So the first one is going to be the, the Intel's DBDK, or development, develop, Data Plane Development Kit. Uh, so this is for networking devices. There's another version called SPDDK. That's for the storage plane door, uh, de development kit. The same idea, of doing kernel bypass for, uh, for interacting with hardware. Again, think of this almost as like it's an API that Intel exposes to you to communicate directly with the, the NIC instead of having to use the syscalls. So they're going to give you libraries that go directly to the NIC, and again, you, you treat it as like a bare metal device, which goes against the entire model of Unix. Right? Unix, is whole, the whole idea was like everything's a file. Uh, every, no matter if it's a device or actual file, you interact with that. So this, this is like breaking that, that idea. So to make this work now, in the database system, we have to implement a bunch of stuff ourselves. In particular, because now we're going directly at the hardware device, we got to implement layer 3 and 4. TCP IP in, in our database system. We have to manage the buffers, right? We have to, and you know, you know, when the NIC gets something, we have to get notified of that and put that data somewhere. That's all now our responsibility. So the benefit that you get potentially, in theory, is that you can get almost zero, zero copy access to, to network messages, right? And the rest of the database system doesn't know that it came through DBDK. Uh, you just process it like normal, but like that, having that the, on the, you're cutting down the, the OS involvement in, in getting data in and out. So to implement TCP IP yourself, you, you could write it yourself, uh, but there's libraries called like fstack that basically took the, the TCP IP code out of FreeBSD and then ported that to user land. Um, we tried using this uh, for one of our works on, uh, Matt was doing research on, on PG Bouncer, Postgres proxies. And we had a, stu uh, a student last semester uh, try to implement fstack in this, and it didn't work. Um, and we're, not, we're not the only ones that have, have these kind of struggles. Like, this is, this is not easy to do. Um, there's two systems I know that are actually doing this. There's Celia DBs. They have this framework called CSTAR. They're doing coroutines and much other stuff, but they're relying on DBDK to do kernel bypass for network activity or network access. Um, they gave a talk with us, I think, about a year or two ago during the pandemic. And they told us that DBDK is a nightmare and they want to get rid of it. Um, and the other one I'm familiar with is Yellowbrick's YBRPC. I think they're only using this for backend communication, not between the client and, and, and the server itself. So I think they use this to communicate with S3 uh, like for their object store. So don't take my word for it that, like, so this, this, you read this, it sounds amazing. Like, you want to use it for this. But don't take my word for it that, that it's going to be a bad idea. Uh, this is probably one of my favorite tweets of all time. Um, so this guy's referring to SPDK, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's the, same, uh, the, the, the same metaphor applies here. So uh, <laughs> I don't recommend it. We spent, a, we spent an entire semester with one of my best master students, and we couldn't get to work. All right, so this is not good. We can't use this. The next approach is you RDMA, um, remote, remote direct memory access. And the idea here is that there's, there's now an API that allows the, 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 what I'll call the client, but it could be the server itself, to have one, one machine interact with the memory 
of another machine directly without going through the CPU, without going through the OS. And so you can do reads and writes into the memory of, of another machine. Right? Uh, and the server itself is unaware that you're doing these things. So obviously, there's a, there's a bunch of bookkeeping you need to do to set things up to say, OK, well, here's the memory region where our database data or data is, is you know, read and write can be located. And then something needs to know, OK, when, when things get written, uh, if, I, if the other side has to do something, you need a way to notify them and say, go ahead and do something. I, 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 this might be out of date. In the old versions, there wasn't callbacks. I don't know if the new versions have callbacks. I'd have to double check this. Um, but the two systems that I know that support RDMA um, is Oracle Rack, most famously. And they're using this actually for the buffer pool. So they can, uh, it's not a shared memory system, but they use RDMA to make things look like uh, sort of shared memory across, across the nodes. Um, and then Microsoft Farm was a OTP system at a Microsoft Research where they were using RDMA to do fast transactions. But because it's RDMA, because again, you don't have notifications to say when things get changed and some people get notified, they, they don't do two-phase commit, they don't do three-phase commit, they do four-phase commit to get everyone to synchronize that transactions are gonna, are, can commit. So again, this also requires specialized hardware. Like you need like Mellanox uh, and Fanaban hardware to do this. I think you can do RDMA over, eth over Ethernet uh, now, but I, I, again, I don't know many data systems that's actually using this. What I'm more bullish about, uh, and it's very, very new, is called IOU Ring. Who here has heard of IOU Ring? Sorry. Well, he doesn't count. You don't, you don't count either. Yeah. All right. So IOU Ring is this new system call that came out last, I guess, 2019, so four years now, um, to allow you uh, zero copy asynchronous IO uh, in, in Linux. And the way to think about this is that it's like, uh, it's like the DPDK where you want to avoid extra copies of, of data coming off the NIC, but you don't want to give up the OS doing a bunch of stuff you don't want to do. So when I talked about DPDK, I said, like, oh, you have to write TCP IP handling code yourself. Well, the OS already has that. We don't want to reimplement ourselves. So the IOU, IOU ring is a way to get kind of zero copy but let the OS still do all that kind of crap we don't, we don't want to do, right? So it first came out in 2019 for accessing storage devices, and then there was a patch added to Linux, yeah, I think it emerged in 2022, that can now do, uh, do this for ne network devices. Uh, this is, it's called IU Ring in, in, the, in the Linux world. Windows has their own thing called the, the IO compilation ports, or, or completion ports, I think it's called. Uh, it's basically, it's basically the same thing as IU Ring, but they don't do batching. But the way it works is like they, the, the OS is going to expose these two buffers to you that you are potentially queues, and you say, here's work I want done, and then there's another queue that says, here's when things get done. But what, the difference is now when you say, you know, go read from this network device, you pass along the buffer of memory where you want the OS to put your data into. Right? You malloc up, the data doesn't malloc that, that, that space, puts that in the buffer, and then the OS writes into that. Because without that, the OS is going to copy it in its own buffers, and then when you call, you know, read or whatever on the, on, on the, through the regular syscall, then it copies into your buffer. So this is reducing that extra copy by letting the OS do it for you, right? And you, you can batch things, and there's callbacks. Uh, it has to be completion, not comp competition. Um, but anyway, so, so this is the way I think people are going to build uh, data systems going forward. Um, there are some early implementations of this. So there's some blog articles. This is from QuestDB, which is a, it's actually a Java-based um, time series uh, system out of, out of the UK. What's that, sorry? <laughs> I'm just making a joke that it's like Java. When you said Java-based, I just thought of Rust, because that's what you said Rust in the 90s. Sure, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so sorry. I don't think it's this dude. Like, they gave a talk with us, I think, last year. Uh, a lot of the high frequency trading guys use use Java, and they, they like like there's there was a system called Lomax out of the UK that was like getting insane throughput numbers even though it was the JVM, because you basically do a bunch of stuff to avoid the JVM's garbage collector, you do you keep off heap memory stuff like that right, uh, so the idea is that he this guy the, the the guy in the UK he basically applied all the techniques to build high performance like trading applications in in, the, in fintech and apply it to a database system here even again even though it's Java. Um, I forget whether, I think they used JNI to cut off Java at some point and go down to C or C++. 
All right, so they have a blog article about using IO ring. Uh, there's another one from, uh, this is Tiger Beetle, which is a, it's a OTP system out of South Africa that does, it's written in Zig instead of Rust, sorry. Um, but they gave a talk with us last semester. And then there's a blog article from ClickHouse that says, oh, you know, here's, here's, here's what IU ring can do in ClickHouse, right? But if you go look at the pull request for the, the code for the IU ring, U -ring uh, enhancement to ClickHouse, this guy comes back and says, like, they didn't get that big of an improvement and became very, very hard to deal with. And then the guy who actually wrote the code couldn't figure out why there was bugs. Uh, so this, this patch never got merged. So they rust. He says they should rust. I don't think. <laughs> Yes. Just write it as, like, normal code, or I mean, there, there's, so the statement is there's a Rust creator library that, that wraps IU ring, makes it look like a regular syscall, even though it's doing IU ring stuff with callbacks, I'm assuming, right? Yeah. So, so just write it in Rust. I, there's, I think there's C++ libraries that do the same thing. I don't know how about them form, but like there's, like there's abstractions, or the libraries that wrap around this, this kind of stuff. Anyway. So for, uh, for networking, I don't get it. Other than uh, Tiger Beetle, I don't think anybody else is doing this for networking stuff. But I think this is going to be, going forward, this is going to be one of the big, big enhancements people are going to add to, um, to the server. And certainly if you're building a system today from scratch, you should think about, OK, can I do, it's not true kernel bypass, because you're, like, you're still using the kernel, but like, you're, just, you're just trying to get zero copy asynchronous I.O., which is essentially what you really want. Um, yeah, OK. All right, so this, is a, this is, doesn't have IU ring, because this is the paper we wrote in 2020 before IU ring could do network uh, support for networks. This is a paper we wrote with, the, with Wes McKinney, the, the arrow guy, where we, we, in our system, we were trying to measure how quickly can you get data out in these different approaches. Uh, so you have here, you know, higher is better. So how, you know, how many megabytes of data can you get uh, just trying to do a bulk export? And, so the slowest one here is Postgres, no, no, no surprise. Here's the vectorized version of Postgres and the way that the, uh, you know, the, paper, the DuckDB guys talk about. Here's if you use Arrow Flight, uh, using like the you know, direct export of, of Arrow data, which again, our system stored Arrow data in memory natively. So you know, it's basically just, you know, zero copy onto, to the wire to get it out. And then here's the RD, RDMA version of it. So this is why I, I'm bullish on Arrow Flight or, Think of this like early version of ADBC, because um, you can get this without specialized hardware. And this is also without IU ring or DPDK. So it's still pretty good. All right, so the last thing I want to mention is an alternative to kernel bypass called user bypass. Uh, and this is, what, this is what, my, what my PhD student Matt's working on. And so the idea here is that uh, similar to the IOU ring, where you're letting the OS do some work for us, and that work was what the, the OS was meant to do anyway. They already had the implementation of this. With uh, user bypass, the idea is that we're taking database logic that would normally exist up in user code that we write, and we're going to embed that inside of the kernel, like a kernel module, and let the kernel run whatever our database code we need. And the way we can do this now is through this thing called EPVF. I'm going to show of hands who here has ever heard of EPVF. OK, some of you. These two don't count. Um, <laughs> I got you. No? OK. Um, so the, the way to, pri the, before EPPF, the way you have to do this is through writing kernel modules. So you either write this in C, uh, or you, know, you, you compile your kernel, sorry, you compile your module and link it in, and then it, you know, hope you don't hit a kernel panic because you segfault or something like that, or you modify the kernel, add the functionality you in, and then recompile your kernel, but no one's going to do that either. But with EPPF, the idea is that, like the JVM was the hot thing in the 90s, this thing has its own VM that runs inside the kernel. So you write your EPVF program in, in their DSL, it then gets compiled, and then there's a verification process to make sure you don't do stupid things or do things you shouldn't be doing, like you can't call malloc in, the, in your program, right? You store things in, in their, these kernel maps that they provide. Uh, they also count the number of instructions you have, so you can't run forever and lock the kernel up. Then, once it gets verified, it gets loaded into the kernel, and then at runtime, it'll get jitted with the LLVM, right? Uh, and so you can now push some logic that would normally be up in user code. You could write it into their DSL and have that be on the path of data as it goes from the, the hardware 
into the OS to the to the uh, to the database system. Yes. So the DVPF like UDS for the Linux kernel. His statement is is, is EBBF <laughs> like UDS for the Linux kernel? Yes. It's a very apt metaphor. Yes. Put that in the cookie jar. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, but again, like we wouldn't we don't want to do this for everything. Because again, the, the, the programming model is quite limited, so we can't put a SQL, you can't put a SQL parser in there, right? Uh, and, you, and you don't want to do this for any data that you actually need to have stick around, because otherwise you're not getting any benefit. Right? Like think of like, what you want to put down is logic that looks at data as it comes from hardware and then makes a decision of what to do next with that data that where the next thing you want to do doesn't rely on having that data around for a longer period of time. So where we first implemented this was actually for Postgres proxies. So a packet shows up on the proxy, you got to look on the header and say, okay, where's this thing going? And then you immediately shove it back over the network to send it to the database server. So that one, you don't want to spend the, the time to copy it from the kernel up to the, to the to user space, then to look at it really quickly and then send it back down to somewhere else. You can just look at the header really quickly and then shove it back out uh, without having to go, go to the user space. That's much faster. Or you like traversing a B plus tree uh, you look. You bring the page into memory, and you look really quickly. Like you find your divider key and decide what's the next page you want to look at, and then you immediately throw that page away and go get the next one. Now, this is like ignoring the buffer pool and other things like that. But like you can imagine some of the zone map stuff we've talked about uh, when we, in the parquet files. I read it in. The zone map's going to tell me whether anything I need, or the thing I'm looking for, is going to be in some sequence of bytes after that. If not, then I immediately throw that zone map away. That, and so if I can do this now in EPPF. I don't have to spend the, the extra copy to go up into, uh, or spend the time to do the construct search up, up, up into the, the kernel, or sorry, the, the, the database system. I don't know how this is going to play out with IOU ring. Uh, we haven't done that experiment yet, but it may be the case that the IOU ring is so fast that like this, the overhead of doing this extra stuff does, doesn't make sense. But it, we'll, we'll see. All right, so um, again, I like I like the paper. You, I, you know, I signed reading. Well, I, if I didn't like it, I wouldn't have signed it. Um, but the, in my opinion, again, this, this is a, a good example of what's in a database system that a part of the database system that most people overlook, uh, especially in academia. Um, and everyone, again, maybe it's less of an issue because now it just implements Postgres, but the Postgres wire protocol certainly can be improved in the way that we saw in this paper. The kernel bypass stuff is fantastic, uh, but it requires more bookkeeping and it's a huge, it's a huge pain to actually get working. And then user bypass is a, is a new direction, I think, for, for some parts of the database system, but not entirely. Long-term vision is where we're going, I think, is if we're, think of all the things we're trying to do to avoid the OS. What if we just got the OS entirely? Or build a unicorn that only ran our database system? That's the, I think that's, that's where we're going. Uh, the Germans are working on this, but we'll, we'll, we'll see whether we, we can do something here too as well. Okay, all right, so any questions about this? All right, so next class, we're now again going down the stack. We got, we got our packets, so we got our messages, we got our SQL queries. Now we need to convert it into a physical plan. So for the next week, we're going to focus on the query optimization. And I would say this is the hardest part of a database systems. Uh, so the paper I have sent you guys to read is a survey paper from the late 90s uh, from a, one of the top researchers at, at Microsoft. But it's a, it's a rough overview of what the challenges are in query optimization. Even though it's from the 90s, we still have the same problems today. Um, and as I, I think I said this joke last time, if you, if you get lost in this, don't worry. Because the joke is, if you can't pack it in query optimization, your backup plan could be like rocket scientists. Because it's harder. This this stuff is harder than doing rocket science. Um, and it's you know people have been trying to do this for 50, 60 years, and it's still terrible. So again, <laughs> good luck. And then after that, we'll then discuss cost models. Uh, it'll be the following week. Okay. All right, guys. Have a good weekend. See ya. <laughs> That's my favorite all pass. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it's the S P Cricket I D E S. I make a mess unless I can do it like a geo. Ice cube with the G to the E to the T. Now here comes Duke. I play the game where there's no rules. You homies on the cup, so yeah, I'm a fool cause I drink fruit. Put the bus a cap on the eyes, bro. Bushwick on the go with a blow to the eyes. Here I come, Willie D. That's me. Rolling with Fifth Ward, South Park, and South Central G. And St. Eyes when I party. By the 12-pack case of a boy. A six-pack 40 act gets the real pounce. 
I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12 ounce. They say Bill makes you fat. But St. Isaac's straight, so it really don't matter. <laughs> 